So uh, welcome to everyone here in person in Ottawa and to uh, those participating online via Zoom to the fourth seminar in the Wed Lab seminar series. Um, this seminar series is run by the Institute for the Study of International Development at McGill University in partnership with Canada's International Development Research Centre. Uh, my name is Kate Grantham. I'm a research associate at McGill University and the coordinator of the Wed Lab seminar series. Today's topic is one I'm really excited about. It's using qualitative feminist methodologies to study women's empowerment and gender equality. And the idea of today's seminar was to really delve into some of the practical, ethical, and methodological considerations for conducting research on women's empowerment and gender equality, uh, especially in developing country contexts. So we have a truly fantastic and diverse panel from academia and civil society present to share their own reflections on the purpose, the process, uh, and the challenges of, of using qualitative feminist research methodologies. So this seminar will take place in two parts. First, we'll have a presentation from our facilitator, Dr. Rebecca Thiessen. Uh, she's going to share reflections from her career as a development practitioner and academic, a pracademic, as some would call it, uh, working on uh, women's empowerment and gender equality. Uh, then we'll take some questions, we'll have a short break, and we'll move into the second part of the seminar, which will be uh, our fantastic panel who are going to be sharing information uh, on their own research, and I'll introduce them each in turn once we get to that portion uh, of the seminar. So just a, a note on uh, taking questions. As I mentioned, we'll take one short round of questions in the first half of the seminar and a second round in the second hour. So for those of you who are participating online, you can email your questions uh, for the facilitator or the panel to me at kathleen.grantham at mcgill.ca. I encourage you to write that email address down because it'll be gone from your screen in a few seconds. We may not be able to get to all of the questions that are posed uh, over email and in person just due to time constraints, so I apologize in advance if we're not able to answer all of them. So, uh, without further ado, it's my true pleasure to introduce our facilitator for today's seminar, Dr. Rebecca Thiessen. Uh, Rebecca is professor, at, professor and Deputy Director in the School of International Development and Global Studies and University Chair in Teaching at the University of Ottawa. Dr. Thiessen received her MA and PhD at the University of Guelph. Her areas of specialization include gender equality and women's empowerment, Canadian foreign aid policy, global service learning, and volunteering for development. Her current Shirk-funded research, which runs from 2019 to 2024, will examine the role and impact of international volunteer programs on gender equality outcomes in 10 countries in the Global South. She has published more than 100 books, journals, uh, journal articles, book chapters, reports, and resources. Her most recent books include Insights on International Volunteering Perspectives from the Global South, a 2018 publication co-edited with me, Kate Grantham, uh, and Benjamin Lau, as well as Learning and Volunteering Abroad for Development, Unpacking Host Organizations and Volunteer Rationales, a 2018 publication, and Obligations and Omissions, Canada's Ambiguous Actions on Gender Equality, a 2017 publication co-authored with Stephen Birani. So please help me in welcoming our facilitator, Rebecca Thiessen. Great, welcome everybody online. I heard there are many of you, so I look forward to getting lots of questions and comments and ideas and suggestions and perhaps critiques. Um, I welcome them all because uh, feminist research is a learning process. Uh, welcome everybody here. Thank you for coming. Uh, it's wonderful to see you. There are many people in the room who have had the opportunity to work with in the past and will have also interesting things to share about their own experiences, including uh, the people on the panel. So let's see. Uh, okay. There are these are the things that I'm going to cover in my presentation. One is just to introduce feminist methodology. What I mean by that, uh, a qualitative feminist methodology, what are the principles, the values, and the approaches. And then my own priorities that I put at the center of my feminist methodology. And there are many different priorities that I focus on, but two that I've been very deliberate about over the last few years. 
The first one is around scholar practitioner research collaboration, keeping in mind some of the challenges that come with practitioner collaboration as a scholar and some of the opportunities that it presents and how that contributes to the kind of research that I can do on gender equality and women's empowerment. The second is around inclusive research involving diverse research partners, but especially focusing on emerging and next generation researchers and scholars. And the panelists on this table, many of them are uh, part of that group. Many of our students uh, that we work with are here in Canada, some postdocs and also emerging practitioners, but also working with some of those colleagues around the world in the experience that I've had uh, working with them. And, and one of the great things about this is I can refer to some of the collaborative work I've done with Kate over the years as well, and how that's helped us think about some of these issues um, that, that I'm gonna present today. All right, there we go. So let me start with some characteristics of feminist research and how I think about it. Uh, in, a, in the works of um, Michel Olivier and Menon Tremblay in 2000, they identified three defining principles of feminist research. The first is that feminist research is characterized by the construction of new knowledge. So that doesn't come as any surprise. I think all research is around this idea of coming up with building new knowledge. The second, which is perhaps a little bit more unique to a feminist approach, is the production of social change. So there's an element of activism that's built into a lot of feminist research projects. Historically, it's informed by women's struggles against their multiple forms of oppression. More recently, it's informed by the diverse struggles of marginalized groups and the employment of an intersectional analysis. So feminist research has really had its heart in dealing with women's struggles, but it's also expanded to include tools, techniques, and processes that allow us to understand diverse marginalized groups and to try to find, uh, to, to come to um, some research findings that, uh, uh, that help us understand different issues across uh, marginalized groups. The second characteristic uh, has to do with feminist research that's grounded in feminist values and beliefs. So here focusing on the meanings that women and other marginalized or silenced groups give to the world. This work is inspired by uh, the ideas of Cynthia Enlow, for example, who asked questions like, where are the women? What do women and other overlooked groups have to share? What kind of knowledge is being overlooked in traditional research practices? What value, knowledge, insights do these overlooked groups have to bring to knowledge generation? So feminist methodologies begin by recognizing that there are some groups that are marginalized and overlooked in data collection, both as objects and as subjects, especially as subjects of research and data collection. And their stories also need to be heard. Feminist and the feminist principles inform all stages of the research from the choice of topic to the presentation of data. And this is where we see lots of wonderful things happening and lots of challenges, including gatekeeping, which I'll get to. Third, feminist research is characterized by its diversity. It's interdisciplinary and it's transdisciplinary. It uses different methods and tools for data collection and knowledge generation and it's constantly being redefined by the concerns of those with whom we're doing our research. So it's adapted, it's changed, it's transformed as a result of the insights and knowledge that's shared by diverse participants in the research project. In terms of being um, activist in orientation, it actively seeks to remove power imbalances between the researcher and the subject of research. Is politically motivated in that it seeks to change social inequality and it begins with the standpoints and experiences of women and other marginalized groups. It includes a wide range of methods both qualitative as I'll talk about today and quantitative which will be the subject of the next web lab. Uh, the methods that are available to feminist researchers and instead of focusing on which type of research is better it makes more sense to allow the context and the purpose of the research to guide the choice 
of research tools and techniques. There's no one method or strategy for feminist research, and I think that's going to become very clear from the panelists today. It's listening oriented, and it's often based in grounded theory. So the results from the data that's collected inform and lead to the theoretical conclusions, rather than starting with theoretical ideas and trying to use your data to demonstrate that theoretical positioning. So informing all stages of the research is important for this project from the choice of the topic of data and knowledge mobilization. So from the, the very beginning in terms of what we choose to research to the very last stages of the research project where we start to share that information with, with broader audiences. And what this does is it changes the way that we view ownership of research. Who owns research? Who steers the research project? who has ultimately control over the dissemination and the product or products. All right, so I covered that already uh, and uh, covered this point about activist and orientation. Now I'm just gonna highlight some of the benefits and the challenges. So first of all, there are many benefits to doing this research, and I'm gonna highlight what comes up in the literature around the benefits of feminist methodology and some of the challenges, and then I'm going to go into the two different types of priorities that I've made uh, deliberate choices about and talk about what the benefits and challenges of each of those have been over the years. So one of the benefits I see is around diverse and unheard stories. Uh, feminist methodology allows us to hear stories that we might not otherwise hear. It can be deeply qualitative in the sense that we can get very rich information from those, uh, those voices that are so sometimes seldom heard. It can avoid, avoid some of the polite or informal research biases that we see in research. And here I'm thinking of you know, Chambers, his work on um, the, he calls it the, the rural biases. But a lot of those biases exist in all sorts of research in similar ways around how we access communities, how we access information from diverse groups of people, and avoiding some of the sort of superficiality that happens in data collection. Mm -hmm. Anybody who has done an interview will probably find that the first part of an interview can be really formal. And it's difficult to get into the rich discussion and dialogue that we really want to generate from a qualitative research process. And a feminist research methodology has to be mindful of those, those formalities that exist, that polite bias that exists, and work on building a, a dialogue so that we can get to some of the richer information. And in that way, it becomes generative. In the process of facilitating a dialogue, knowledge sharing, rather than just inquiry-based, the stories become very rich and can be much more comprehensive. But there are challenges. Qualitative feminist methodology takes a lot of time. It means allowing time to talk to the different participants in your study and to ensure that the space is comfortable and appropriate for the kinds of engagement you wish to have. And it takes a different kind of funding arrangement. And to be honest, I have yet to see a scholarly funding arrangement that truly allows for a feminist research methodology. Yeah. You can work towards it, you can build in aspects, but um, it is an imperfect process and it's very difficult to get the kind of funding that you would need to actually sit down and co-design a research project that would then give you the research funding to continue. So the, 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 the challenge here is that uh, a lot of research that is feminist research and qualitative in nature actually begins with someone coming up with a plan and getting the money for that plan and then doing the background work of actually co-designing a project. And so it's not a perfect process. Mm -hmm. There are many gatekeepers that are difficult to navigate in that process. One of them might be the funding arrangements. The other is around publishing around um, uh, finding venues for the kind of stories that you wish to share and the different ways that knowledge gets dissemination, disseminated by different audiences and how we can try to find spaces for the dissemination of that, who those gatekeepers are, how ideas sometimes don't get um, shared as widely in the different kinds of venues that we want them to be shared. 
It can also take new and unexpected directions, which is very exciting, but it can also be difficult to manage in terms of delivering on what you promise to do for a research grant, for example. And it's goal oriented. So there's never um, an end in sight to, I think, a feminist research methodology. You're always aspiring to do more, to be more participatory in your process, to be more inclusive in the work that you do. So it's something that you work towards. And that can sometimes feel frustrating because uh, we spend a lot of time reflecting on positionality. We spend a lot of time self-doubting and critiquing ourselves and the contributions that we're making to the scholarship because of those, those constant reminders that we have of the limitations of this work. So there are two ways in which I've tried to enact this deliberately, and one is through scholar-practitioner collaboration. Here, coming back to this idea that feminist methodology is the construction of new knowledge and the production of social change. In order to do that, I think we really require deliberate st strategies around collaboration between scholars and practitioners and keeping in mind that some people don't necessarily fit into one category very simply or easily, right? So some people straddle that scholar practitioner division. So that's why there's the slash in between. Uh, uh, many people see themselves as pracademics or scholar practitioners. Um, students can be both scholars and practitioners, and emerging, um, emerging scholars are often aspiring uh, practitioners or academics as well. So it's a blurred set of categories. The collaboration we feel, uh, it, it helps with access to information. So it has a very pragmatic angle to it. As a scholar, working with practitioners allows me to access communities um, often much more easily because I'm able to work with the networks that they have. I can get access to information, I can work with research participants, and I can more easily tap into those networks to get that local knowledge. It can be generative in the sense that it provides insights from diverse team members and it can inform the research. And it's timely. Anybody who, if you've spent a lot of time reading journal articles and that's been the primary focus of, of your, your knowledge generation, you'll quickly realize how dated that material is, right? Because by the time it's, it's, uh, the research is collected, analyzed, goes through peer review, comes out in publication, it's easily a two-year time lag. And if that's the primary data that you're drawing on, that's often very old information. So being able to work with practitioners who can say, oh, we've just collected this uh, evaluation summary report, gives us really contemporary information and, um, and the, working with practitioners has helped me also know what, you know what the pulse is in the communities where they're working in that moment, which is often linked to the, the social political context in which, the, uh, in which they're working. Uh, and then it also has the potential for social impact. So one of the things that I, I value about the scholar practitioner collaboration is the potential to link the work that I'm doing uh, with other ways of mobilizing knowledge beyond scholar, uh, scholarly work. So it could be through social media, through case studies, through uh, website information, reporting that goes on. Uh, it can also inform government policy, which is, I think, also very important and it has a policy advocacy dimension to it as well. There are some considerations or perhaps some challenges, and one is that I do also value that research should sometimes be at arm's length and that has value because um, when you're working with practitioners they have a particular audience that they often need to inform uh, and that audience is often the donors that provide their funding and so how information is collected can be determined not necessarily but it can be determined by the donor reporting mechanisms that are in place and may not provide as much scope for sort of creative, uh, qualitative, in-depth and critical analysis. So that respect for critical analysis is needing, uh, needed and um, working with learning-centered organizations has been a real asset. And there are many that are learning-oriented and have their donor demands that they have to meet, but are also very open to the kinds of critical assessment that can come from collaborating with scholars. Uh, and to use that information to guide their work. 
Funding needs to be allocated to develop and sustain the collaborative process, as I've mentioned earlier, not just in having that funding to get the initial conversation, to co-design the research, to co-create the questions and the, and, the, and the process of doing the research, but also finding time for buying time for practitioners to spend time dedicated on research and not just evaluation and monitoring work. So this may be um, uh, creating small stipends in your research to buy out time for practitioners uh, who could then uh, spend the resources for their organization on hiring someone to fill in for them so they have that dedicated space to think about research and publication. Trust and reciprocity is really important. Um, there, there's an element of trust in, in the sense that we have to keep in mind uh, information that is collected that can be critical can jeopardize the programs that are in place and the sustainability of those programs if the funding gets pulled. And reciprocity in the sense that um, I as a scholar do value the contributions and the pragmatic, pragmatic uh, and positive uh, aspects of working with practitioners but it has to be reciprocal. And so I'm constantly asking my colleagues who I work with, how can they also benefit from the work that we're doing? Involving, and that might mean, you know, what kinds of uh, dissemination material would be more useful for you to reach your audiences? And how can we turn some of the research that we've generated into uh, better consumable material for your, for your public? Involving professional training and ongoing support is also important as the literature highlights. The second priority is around inclusivity. And so this is inclusivity in the research team and how we imagine what our research team, uh, who our research team is. Increased partner ownership of the research and knowledge, knowledge dissemination processes. And hiring locally based research partners wherever possible to try and build capacity of locally, re locally based researchers, providing mentorship of emerging scholars in the development of the full research process. So not just in terms of data collection, but where possible in the research design, getting feedback on interview questions at a minimum, um, helping support the research changes that need to happen uh, based on the expertise and knowledge of locally based researchers who can say that question is not appropriate. Um, it's not something that resonates with our communities. It's not something they would be familiar with. It would be um, politically problematic to ask that question. It could jeopardize the safety of our community members, those sorts of things. Very important to get that information. <laughs> And what's the last? Uh, and from research design to publication of results. So the rationale for inclusivity, I mean, there's some really great scholarship around decentering de critical analysis. Um, as someone who's had lots of fun with post-colonial analyses, uh, I truly believe that there's a lot of value to thinking critically and reflectively about our positionality and about the limitations of our knowledge um, I also think that in emphasizing that to the exclusion of hearing other voices ex and experiences, we also privilege our positionality by constantly trying to deconstruct it. And so by decentering a critical analysis and bringing in more people into that discussion, we can better allow a more, um, uh, a, a larger breadth of discussion around whose critical analysis we're thinking about, what we are critiquing, and what that analysis includes. And this could then contribute in some ways, and like any good feminist researcher, I will say it will never be a final product, but it can work towards the process of decolonizing the scholarship, ensuring that peripheral voices are valorized and included. And in so doing, it can reduce othering and challenge this assumption that that the host communities, uh, as Mohanty argues, as an already constituted coherent group with identical interests and desires, which can be applied universally and cross-culturally, is challenged, right? Mm -hmm. This idea that, that we, we recognize that diversity and agency and voice in those communities, and not only do we recognize it and, and value it, we bring those voices into our analysis. And one of the reasons why this really uh, has resonated with me in, in the research that I've been doing over the years 
is in the research that we've been doing on international volunteers, which has relied very heavily on post-colonial analysis and literature, uh, we've spent a lot of time looking inwardly at the limitations and the colonial continuities of, of, of um, Westerners traveling and, and sharing Western knowledge and ideas around the world in a very critical way. And as we started to collect information from partner organizations and their communities in the Global South, we started to learn that this post-colonial critique did not resonate with the communities with whom we were working, and that their voice and their agency was telling us something very different. Again, a very, there were elements of a very strong critique around lack of reciprocity in, in the structural arrangement of international volunteers who get to travel and spend time in other countries something that, that many of the partner organizations did not get to benefit from. But that this critique that we had around uh, of the, the colonial continuities was overemphasized in our Northern scholarship and was not as much of a, a criticism that was coming from our partner organizations. And so in doing, in hearing those voices, it led us to a whole new set of questions and a whole new research methodology that allowed us, I think, to uh, better understand and to represent the realities of the partner organizations. So that's a feminist methodology. Um, that's what I mean by doing feminist research. So now that I am a feminist and I am doing feminist research, now what? How do I actually enact the kinds of values and beliefs that I have? Well, the experience so far, I'm going to talk about two research projects. One was a partnership development grant that ended last year. Uh, it was a project we were doing with um, WUSC and SESI and also uh, involved a number of uh, research partners. My co-PI on this project, uh, Dr. Benjamin Lowe at the University of Illinois, uh, Urbana-Champaign is um, key to this project. And then some continued work that we were able to do as a result that's currently underway, building on that and trying to build in a bit of space now after having heard some of the voices, having get it, received some of the feedback, having been given some ideas for the kinds of research that should be done, we were able to take the lessons from that first project and weave that into our project design for the second uh, research project, which we're currently working on. I'll give you an overview of what we've tried to do, some of the benefits and challenges along the way in the learning process, and it won't take me very long um, to do that. First, just to give some highlights on the work that we did in the first study, uh, we worked with countries um, listed here from 2014 to 2018 and we were looking at partner country perspectives on the role and impact of international volunteers and we did that by first hiring locally based consultants to collect data try to get away from that polite bias because if I go and I interview colleagues and say what do you think about having Canadians come and volunteer well they see me as a Canadian and perhaps they project a particular kind of story uh, to me that they might not to someone more locally based. Perhaps not, but it's, um, it's a strategy that can be used to try and reduce some of the bias. Hiring locally based researchers then to analyze that data. So um, sitting down with research participants uh, from those seven countries, we were able to, nine countries in total actually, um, we were able to do some training, and by we I mean Kate Grantham and I, did some training and helped uh, our, our research partners in those countries reflect on the different way that uh, the findings can be analyzed, come up with some tools and techniques to do content and discourse analysis of the qualitative interviews, and to also provide some training and support for writing up their findings. Uh, lots of free reign was given to the, the participants to analyze the data, and they came up with the own, their own storylines based on the findings that they were reading. They collaborated with, uh, so we collaborated with these locally based scholars in the production of final papers. We brought the researchers and authors together, uh, at least some of them, for a dissemination information session at a regional conference in South Africa. And in the end, the final stage was that the, the nine research participants had sole authorship of their own work. And despite, you know, a lot of kind of editing and, and ghostwriting that maybe went into some of the papers, not all, um, they still retained full authorship in their own name 
in a, a special issue collection in the Voluntarist Journal. So this is that example I told you about where some of us got to come together, the four researchers based in East and Southern Africa met at a conference. Uh, Claire, Dennis, Sarah, and Andrew uh, in the front row are the researchers. They presented their research at this conference. And it's one of those moments that I just cannot not tell this story because it was one of those most rewarding moments in my life where I got to watch these amazing young scholars present their work and watch an audience of colleagues thrilled to see their own students, their own young people in, in owning and sharing this information and um, incredibly supportive of these, uh, of these people. So it was a really rewarding experience, I think, for all of us. In the back is Kate and myself and a colleague from Universities Canada, Anna Siegfried. So that's that research project. Um, it's not perfect either, but uh, it aspires to be better than what I've uh, done before. And it's led us to trying to do better uh, for this research project in some ways. So again, using a feminist methodology to study the impacts of development programs that are promoting specifically here, we're focusing on gender equality and women's economic empowerment in this, uh, in this version. We're working with partner organizations and also collecting community perspectives, both through interviews and also through case studies that we're doing. And focusing on knowledge sharing and capacity building and relationship building as the heart of, of the focus of this, this research. The activities here involve hiring research assistants for data collection in 10 countries. We have four locally based research assistants or who were locally based at the, t or at the time. Uh, I hired a woman in Vietnam who speaks Vietnamese and just was there. I trained her and she collected the data. She will analyze the data uh, in partnership with me and she will write up uh, her report in a chapter for a book, sole authorship, a Ghanaian, uh, Malawian, and Anne did research for us in Kenya when she was back in the summer, a uh, couple years in 2018, and uh, wrote up reports for that. Anne's in the room with us. I'm looking. I was looking over at her, but for those of you listening in, you don't know where I'm looking. <laughs> um, and six University of Ottawa students, recent graduates, that traveled to these countries over the last few months. So we still have one in Tanzania. I'm going to go and visit her and sort out the research ethics clearance in Tanzania tomorrow, I leave. <laughs> um, uh, and then um, Rika did research in Senegal. She's going to talk about that. Um, we have Pascal who did research in Peru. Uh, someone's, uh, Adrian is still in Guatemala. Bryn might be online. She went to Nepal. She was going to try and join in. And um, and then we have uh, a colleague that did research in Uganda. I'm not sure if she's online either. We were working in collaboration with uh, actually three NGOs, so WUSC and SESI and also CUSO and their partner organizations in these 10 countries. There's uh, again a focus on dissemination around presentation by the research team and publication of all of the 10 researchers through case studies that will be made publicly available on websites and so on and also through book chapters. One of the other activities that I think is under um, sort of uh, underappreciated maybe, maybe is the level of trust that goes into working with uh, researchers in this capacity through a feminist methodology. And by that I mean the students, the research assistants were all given seven core questions to ask. And within each of those questions were sub questions that they had to come up with called probing questions. Gave them a lot of free reign to, as they were listening, to ask questions to really try to understand what their programs on the ground involved. So a level of trust in their capacity to do good work and to have good listening skills. There was an element of training, but it was uh, short and um, pretty quick. So the focus of the findings though, what's really interesting about the research that we're doing and having been reading the transcripts, and you'll hear more about them, uh, some of them in the, in the panel presentations, reading those transcripts um, is fascinating to hear these references to the kind of relationship building that happens as a result of international volunteers in the promotion of gender equality and women's empowerment. 
references to things like they become our friends uh, and they spend time and they get to know us and they get to know our programs. And so what's really interesting about the International Volunteer Program, and although volunteerism is highly criticized in, in, in media, makes sense, there are many challenges that, that, that we need to recognize. International volunteer programs, volunteer for development programs, where volunteers are often spending six months, a year, sometimes two years overseas, <sighs> occupy a very unique space that consultants don't occupy, that development program workers often don't occupy, that very few other um, development agents occupy on a regular basis. And that's extended periods of time working side by side to provide support and solidarity with partner organizations. It's agency oriented in its focus. Uh, the research tells us about the context that the partner organizations experience in navigating problematic structural realities. So our emphasis on agency is not to deny the structural barriers of inequality, global structural barriers that exist. We recognize them, our partner organizations highlight them and mention them. But what's interesting about the findings, it tells us how people use their agency and their, and their capacities to navigate those problematic structural barriers and sometimes to work to dismantle them. International volunteer programs can inspire some of the new attitudes and behaviors in the promotion of gender equality and women's empowerment. And so we're seeing a lot of references to the international volunteers play role model type roles in communities uh, and have changed people's perceptions of what is possible in some spaces. And there are always some challenges around that. And finally, it's about creating space for critical reflection and discussions and dialogue. And that, that's partly because there's that time that's spent, that time that's spent in having conversations and creating those spaces to critically reflect. So in one of the transcripts in Nepal, for example, uh, the international volunteer was working uh, through a workshop with, with women to try and um, help them understand uh, the kinds of constraints that they were facing so that they could work towards women's empowerment programs. And one woman in, in Nepal says that my domestic work is now, she realizes, is actually labor and I do it all. I never thought to think critically about my life. And so this workshop gives me a space to be able to have that critical reflection and to think about why I need to, I need to begin to value the work that I do. And it's only once I start to value it and recognize it for the work that it is that I can try and um, change other people's attitudes also about the importance of that work. So these conversations are shaping the way that women's rights, youth participation, and diverse experiences and so on um, are, are addressed. The result is that gender equality is increasingly becoming part of the language and practice of development programming and international volunteers can play an important role in that space. Lastly, there are some challenges and limitations, uh, limited funding opportunities uh, to meet with teams in advance to co-design research. This remains a challenge uh, to de determine collectively the research questions Deliverables, they still need to align with what the funder priorities are. In my case, SHRC funding priorities include, thankfully, they include mentoring next generation scholars. So that's something that I can say is part of what we're doing and that's it's recognized and valued. But the emphasis on journal publications, for example, is significant and isn't necessarily what partner organizations and some of the research team uh, members that I work with wish to do as their, their publication process. So those are limitations. Uh, there are opportunities that come with semi-structured interviews for rich discussion, uh, but it does require a lot of, of probing skills and good listening techniques, and it can be very difficult to monitor. Um, and honestly, we just can never do enough and, uh, and, and never do it as well as maybe we aspire to do. So it does, I think, in many ways, construct new knowledge, produce social change through the kinds of strategies that I've talked about. Uh, and I, I look forward to hearing how the panelists will give some concrete examples of their work and their methods and approaches. Okay, thank you so much for that, Rebecca. Uh, in hearing your presentation, I just kept thinking to myself that I don't think anyone I know actually embodies the 
the spirit of doing kind of thoughtful, inclusive, collaborative research that really prioritizes mentorship and support more than you. So I think you're a fantastic person to be facilitating this seminar. I want to move on to, we have about maybe five minutes to do some questions. We'll start with those here in the room. If anyone has a question, um, feel free to raise your hand. And when you ask your question, just make sure that you turn your microphone on and perhaps introduce yourself. Um, anyone in the room? Maybe still digesting a little bit? Okay. We also, uh, last I checked, there are no questions online. Um, so if possible, if no one has anything now and you want to think about it, we'll take a five minute break and then we can just do all of the questions at once at the very end of the seminar. That's an option as well. Okay, sounds good. From here, we'll take a five minute break and we'll all come back at 1.45. Thank you. Uh, welcome back. Um, uh, I'm very excited for the second portion of our seminar today where you're gonna hear from our fantastic panel. Uh, we're starting with a presentation from Yana Gare. She's the Global Lead Monitoring Evaluation Accountability uh, and Learning with CUSO International. So Yana is a accredited evaluator uh, applied researcher and project manager. She's been advising public and not-for-profit organizations on the effectiveness and efficiency of their policies and programming. Her areas of specialization include evaluation methodologies for international development interventions, capacity building, and data insights and visualization. At CUSO International, Yana ensures the organization's project portfolio integrates sound, gender equality, and women's empowerment measures. Previously, she was an associate researcher with the Institute for Evaluation and Social Analyses in Prague, Czech Republic. Uh, she received her MA in Applied Social Psychology from the University of Saskatchewan and professional designation of credentialed evaluator from the Canadian Evaluation Society. So welcome, Jana. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, my presentation will be very much from the practitioner perspective. So we do some programming trying to cause the social change and you're struggling more the sign of research in it and measuring the impact. So I'll touch on that a little bit. Uh, so for those of you who are not very familiar with what QSO International does, uh, I mean, there is a kind of a large and diverse portfolio of projects. I picked only two specific examples. Uh, the first one is kind of the core of the organization's business over many decades, and that's the international volunteering, volunteering for development, B4D. Uh, that current project is currently running in 17 countries across three continents, and uh, we do have, a, we call it JESSE, gender equality and social inclusion component, both as a programmatic focus in several of our countries, and we also have it as a cross-cutting issue. So even countries that are not necessarily very like gender focused, they do sort of the gender mainstreaming or they're adding gender into their other eco sorry, economic or other programming. Uh, I also selected an example of a project that's recently started in Peru that's funded uh, through the Women's Voices and Leadership Global Affairs Canada funding stream. And of course, our programming and everything we do, we're trying as much as we can to align to the feminist international assistance policy, not because we have to, but because we really want to get our projects up on the speed and be really gender transformative. So then what happens when we try to measure what we actually do? Well, it is challenging. It is quite difficult, particularly because we are very used to using the result-based management approach and the methodologies of the typical logic models and performance measurement frameworks with the set indicators, et cetera, which do have their use and they have their place. I certainly don't want to discredit that, but oftentimes we, we find that it's not quite enough. The other challenges include the degree of distance by what I, which I mean uh, specifically in the volunteer sending project. Uh, so I'm sitting here in Ottawa and I'm trying to call it, you know, the data and the metrics and design the system for the entire network of the 17 countries where we work. We do have country program offices with local staff. They have their partner organizations who host the volunteers. And then those partners usually have other communities and other degree of distance of beneficiaries, members, uh, doing advocacy for someone else, et cetera. So I don't really have much of the resources and the access to those communities to begin with. The other challenge is also if we work in a capacity building, it tends to be much more difficult to capture, to measure, to operationalize because, I mean, it's not something so explicit as health indicators or economic indicators, etc. And obviously internal capacity, having a sound, you know, social science research or monitoring and evaluation capacity across the network of our offices, while our program staff have to do all sorts of other things. That's definitely has been a challenge. 
So a few examples of what we try to do. So for the volunteering program, um, we are in the last fifth year of the current project. And so we decided to carry out a small scale end of project evaluation, which is pretty much really our initiative. Uh, it's all about learning. So it's kind of like research oriented, but really within the organization, we speak about learning and the necessity to learn. Are we doing well? Can we do better? What are we learning from the field, etc.? So we do have five countries as a sample. The four of them are more focused on sort of quantifying the impact on one hand and do a little bit learning on the other hand. While we were fortunate to partner with uh, Dr. Rebecca Thiessen and her research team at the University of Ottawa, and we did have a, a research assistant going to Peru over summer, and Pascal is here, so you will hear all about that just in a few minutes. And the other item that we included is we are testing a sort of a internal exercise that's um, inspired by the outcome harvesting methodology and that is hopefully uh, going to help our staff to reflect more internally it's more inward focus on what the achievements have been of this project and what's really the change that we've seen over the five years of the project with the long-standing partnerships in their specific context and their specific communities so that's uh, still up, up and coming this fall so we'll see how that's going to go uh, for the next example, so that's the project in Peru, uh, Women's Voices and Leadership. Uh, we are working very closely with four leading feminist organizations. They're really the organizations on the ground in Peru. Each of them slightly different focus, a different network, but reaching pretty much to most regions in Peru, combining reach into rural, urban areas, indigenous women doing advocacy, uh, you know, fight for human rights and for gender equality, helping victims or survivors of domestic violence, etc. And the partnership with the project is very unique because it's really uh, all the organizations are kind of on an equal footing. They're equally responsible for the implementation, for the monitoring, for designing the project and for really collecting the data and see how it's going. So all of them will receive sort of a technical monitoring and evaluation training to be able more than anything to adhere to sort of the requirements and expectations and the standards and kind of the result based management. But on top of that, what we try to include into the meal approach for the entire project, with again, very limited resources for doing any kind of such work, is what we call quarterly reflective meetings that the four organizations will meet together with the staff from Kiso Peru. And the meetings will be facilitated by a, probably a meal consultant that's been hired to kind of work with the project on a more ongoing basis. And uh, they will be reflecting A, on the data, what we'll be hearing, what we're seeing, what's coming from the field, what's coming from the networks of each of the organizations. Uh, the organizations, despite being sort of like in the same field as it could seem, they're sometimes more in a rivalry than a co cooperation or they can have different perspectives. So also kind of this challenging and, you know, reflecting and trying to work together and kind of align. So uh, that's, you know, like trying to be nimble, trying to be a little bit more responsive to the realities. Also, very importantly, in the context of the project, uh, the result-based management is a lot about increases over time as the indicators. However, here, uh, certain conservative powers, you know, are kind of pushing against the achievements of the past. So we're also setting this in to make sure that uh, we capture all kind of the unexpected or the fact that just maintaining the status quo is actually a success. So that's kind of like all these aspects trying to baggage into a very, very little space and resources. And the last example, I hope I still have some time. <laughs> Uh, so recently we put together a sort of proposal for a SEDIL call. SEDIL is a consortium of uh, four to five organizations that are kind of research oriented or more think tanks. Um, we worked again with uh, Dr. Rebecca Thiessen to help us to kind of nail it down uh, research wise and methodologically. Uh, what we were going to look at was more of a global effect of the V4D um, programming on the communities and specifically in some fragile contexts, uh, Myanmar and DRC. So in our regular monitoring, we usually look at things with a specific uh, timeline or within a specific framework. So we're asking our countries to submit data for the last three months, for the last 12 months, for the specific partner, for the specific placement of a volunteer. So this we saw as an opportunity to really look at more of a global scale, what is happening in the communities. So we know we send volunteers to develop specific skills, to work with a specific partner on a specific area but they also develop relationships. They influence people just through being in those communities to getting involved in a lot of other, you know, extracurricular, extra work activities. And so what we were thinking in terms of methodology was using sort of the ripple effect mapping, looking really at the ripples. So the volunteer 
develops a wor workshop or delivers a, some skill building session, develops a relationship, accompanies the person or the group if it's some process, what happens next? And I know that Pascal has some of this in her research, so hopefully she'll touch on that. Uh, the other thing that really inspired us and at least inspires me a lot I and mean, I think through this work is the listening project that has been developed and implemented years ago by the CDA Collaborative Learning and I think we will hear a lot more about it in one of the panel presentations too. And lastly, we were going to use the ripple effect mapping uh, methodology to kind of map uh, community capitals so there are seven categories at least in the approach we were going to use and so we are trying to kind of assess to what extent uh, any of those interventions the v4d actually developed any of the seven groups of capital social human cultural build natural i think you can fill in i'm missing two i'm sure <laughs> so i think i'm at 10 minutes now <laughs> Actually good. Uh, so in conclusions, that's just a couple of points I reflected on when I was present, uh, sorry, preparing the presentation. It is very true that the RBM approaches may be uh, necessary for certain things, but not sufficient. And it's very important that we think through additional alternative methodologies and approaches. At the same time, I feel like no matter how sophisticated our methods are, it's the questions that matter. Are we asking the right questions? Are we asking the right people? Are we involving the right people? Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of the key before we even like get into the methods is like really nailing down the questions. And the other one is the long road is often the best by which I mean uh, participation and ownership. And in my uh, specific situation, it's not just the communities, but even like being more participatory across the organization. If you do not involve the staff in the countries, if you do not explain and train the partners, well, that really affects the data, the quality of what you get back. So it's really, really important to spend the time and it's sometimes it's very difficult to make the argument. The reporting cycles are very busy. There is really report after report, deadline after deadline, and the people are working on so many more things. So there is a fragile balance to strike. Is that? Thank you very much. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Hannah. I feel like you were like 15 seconds under 10 minutes. So oh gosh, your concern yeah. was, was <laughs> unnecessary. That was perfect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Sheila's going to take her time. <laughs> 10 seconds. Uh, well, it is uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce our next panelist, Dr. Sheila Rao. Uh, Sheila is a postdoctoral researcher at the School of International Development and Global Studies at the University of Ottawa. Dr. Rao is an anthropologist and research consultant in international development. She uses a feminist lens to examine nutritional health and food systems, communication technologies and digital networks, rural urban livelihoods, and institutional partnerships in the Global South. She has over 15 years of experience working overseas, designing, developing, and managing research for development projects. Her current research, which is funded by CCIC, MyTax, and the University of Ottawa, examines the organizational and human resource capacity for addressing gender equality and women's empowerment in Canadian and overseas partner organizations. So welcome, Sheila. Thanks very much, Kate, and thank you, Yana and Rebecca, for your presentation. So for my um, quick uh, presentation and contribution to, to this panel, um, I'll focus a little bit on um, my doctoral research, but more specifically to look at um, the methodology that was used there and to sort of unpack what the benefits and opportunities could be for, for using that kind of methodology um, to address gender equality and women's empowerment. Uh, so I'll just go through um, the context of the research, um, highlight the methodology, and focus more on the lessons and reflections. So my research was really looking at um, the gender dynamics of food systems, um, the interconnections between dietary practices and food production and development strategies. Um, and I did this through a specific uh, case study and um, examining uh, the promotional activities around biofortification and specifically biofortified crop production. Um, this was looking, um, I focused on an area in Tanzania, in Wasanga Village, Tanzania, which had a high prevalence of malnutrition in young children under five and uh, uh, pregnant and lactating women. So that was sort of the area where biofortification or biofortification projects were, were currently being targeted. But what I was interested in my research as an anthropologist was really um, unpacking these assumptions around gendered normative, um, normative gender roles um, within food systems and to look at other interconnections that existed in everyday lives of, of uh, women living, women and men living in the Masanga village in the Masengi district. 
Um, so as an anthropologist, ethnography is sort of the main um, methodology used. And more specifically for my research, I used ethnography through a feminist political economy lens. So just briefly, um, ethnography allows us to, um, to have this long-term in-depth a participant observation study um, that looks at the uh, that's centered on the everyday life in a particular setting um, and through this eth um, ethnographic process um, I specifically looked at the state and non-state engagement with social and economic matters and how these feed into national and international policies research and, in, um, and investment agendas and <clears throat> and how this productive and reproductive roles um, within households and outside of households, paid and unpaid, sort of play into these kinds of engagements, the non-state and state engagements. So for me, um, ethnography is known as, as sort of a long-term investment in, in research activities. And for anthropologists, it could, um, you can invest years in a particular setting. Um, they say like the shortest timeline is around three months in a particular setting um, to really be able to um, engage um, at the everyday level and to develop collaborations and partnerships that allow you to conduct that kind of research. There's also different kinds of participation involved in participant observation. So it could be from as in that picture actually um, working with the farmers directly or at slightly an arm's length um, distance like through an association and organization working with the farmers or just simply as an observational um, just simply through observation. But what fem feminist political economy lens allows me to do or allowed me to do was to look at the everyday level, but also take into consideration the larger research agendas around biofortification and the implications of what the, the politics take place at that everyday level and how that might feed into those greater research agendas and the scaling up of those activities. So I'm just going to briefly like focus. I'm going to focus more on the lessons and the reflections of using ethnographic research as a feminist methodology, and just highlight a couple of key findings or sort of um, takeaways that I gained as as um, working in this kind of setting. Um, so for me, I worked uh, in Tanzania for nine months, um, and it's impossible to conduct that kind of research without collaborating. Um, so I collaborated with two research assistants. One was a retired um, develop, um, government uh, worker, and the other was a recent graduate from a master's program at University of Dar es Salaam, and both contributed immensely both to data collection, but also the analysis and the write-up of the findings. In addition to those individual contributions, um, there were several NGOs at various levels that also contributed to the research um, and where my research also contributed to their ongoing work in the, in the country. So Helen Keller International was based in Wanza and they were looking at similar kinds of health and nutrition interventions. Farm Ready International um, had a, uh, a project uh, with radio programs that were promoting um, biofortified crops. And the Tanzanian Home Economics Association um, were, was really the, the one organization um, that had that strong connection to Mosanga Village, so I worked with them closely. And throughout all those organizational um, collaborations, there's this exchange of capacity building between myself and, those, and the org staff of the organization, access to resources both in um, both for myself and, and for the organization. And on the everyday level, and that engagement also allowed us to create new perspectives on, on the topics that we were looking at. The nine month ethnographic research also allowed us to sort of make these linkages that we weren't able to see if we were just looking at um, the intervention or growing nutritious crops or just focused on biofortification. So because, we were, because I was there over two planting seasons, I was able to make these, um, we were able to look at um, instances of seasonal acute malnutrition, which was due to climate variability. And um, so even though it was a place where biofortified crops was targeted, um, there were still uh, reasons or there were still in, um, uh, people being affected by malnutrition for other reasons that weren't accounted for in those promotional activities. It also allowed me to, um, to see that uh, women uh, invested their labor outside of the household uh, into sort of nutritional health for themselves, for their families, and for their communities through their own businesses and through their own sort of um, um, their own uh, uh, spaces of business. So there was these um, 
uh, businesses called Mama Liches, which uh, offer um, healthy, uh, fresh meals for um, people in the community, for people in the markets. Um, and each those meals contain um, rice and beans and fruit. So it's a, a much balanced meal for, for those that um, are able to, um, to pay for it. Um, and this, this allowed us to, to give us a little bit more um, perspective on that sort of um, productive roles outside of the household that women engage with and, and it dealt with nutritional health. So going forward, so this, uh, the, my data was collected in 2015 to 2016, and now I've moved on to um, a new research project, and we're looking at the organizational capacity of, um, for organizations to address gender equality and women's empowerment. And it's, allow, it's, it's um, um, allowing me to sort of center more on the intersectionality of feminist research and to look at the analysis across race and sexuality, ethnicity, class, age, and also through this historical and political context. So in doing that, we can highlight these processes of marginalization and vertical power relations. So who has access to social and economic mobility and who does not and why at a certain given, at a certain period of time, as that process is always moving and it's always fluid. So for example, when I was conducting my research um, in Tanzania at the time, there was a uh, a lot of um, backlash against the LGBTQ community. Um, and this also played into some of the interviews that were taking place in the radio stations and, um, and gave us a new perspective or a, a pers um, insight into uh, how gender relations um, are viewed and perceived and presented in the media and, and sort of in that national narrative. And so how do we make these linkages with those kinds of um, framings with um, how we're looking at gender equality and women's empowerment in our research. And secondly, um, to just follow on with what Rebecca and Yana was saying, this idea of who we are as researchers and, and active participants and collaborator, collaborators in the research um, also plays into what kind of data we're, being, we're collected, um, how we're able to disseminate that research, who uh, benefits from the research itself. Um, for me, I was a non-white female, um, uh, living in Tanzania at the time with my children and partner um, and that allowed me to have um, certain access to conversations and spaces that I might not have access to or someone else might ha have access to and which was also quite beneficial in understanding other ways that women um, engaged in different livelihood practices um, at the everyday level as well. So just to conclude um, a, a feminist approach to ethnography helps us to um, contribute to this openness inclusivity of research. So we're, we can move beyond these assumptions that are embedded in, in these framings of knowledge production, production and normative gender roles within food systems in particular. Um, but it, um, as Rebecca also mentioned, that it really is dependent on trust between the research participants, the people that we're working with, um, the, our research collaborators or partners, um, and how we engage in that particular setting. So by design, ethnography is really a collaborative process. Um, the other benefit to ethnography, um, whether you're doing it for three months or five years, is, is that it helps us to slow the research process down. It integrates time, resources, and spaces for this reflection and for um, strategic collaboration, for strengthening these collaborations within the research pro process. It allows us to create these linkages at different scales. So what's happening at the everyday level with the people we're trying to work versus um, what's happened historically and politically at any given time. So I'm just gonna stop there and thank you very much. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Sheila. Uh, up next, we have Jessica Kadeski, who is a PhD candidate at the School of International Development and Global Studies at the University of Ottawa. As a gender and violence prevention specialist, Jessica has worked with the United Nations, the Red Cross Red Crescent Movement, and international and local NGOs. She's worked in Cambodia, the Central African Republic, Liberia, Haiti, Nepal, Lebanon, and several other countries in the Middle East. Her doctoral research applies the method of life histories to understand how gender mainstream post-conflict aid programming has impacted gender equality in northern Sri Lanka, as understood from the perspective of men and women beneficiaries. Jessica holds a BA in International Development from the University of Guelph 
and an MA in Gender and Development from the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Sussex in the UK. So welcome, Jessica. Thanks, Kate, and thanks also Rebecca and Yana and uh, Sheila for setting up uh, the session up until now. I've learned so much and I can already see so many linkages between what I'm about to say, so apologies if I repeat some things, I'll, I'll try and focus on sort of what I have to freshly offer. Um, so I, I wanted to talk a little bit about a particular strain or element within feminist uh, critical theory or, and how it can be applied to feminist methodologies. Um, something that's inspired me sort of in retrospect when I look back onto one of the projects that I was involved in before I started my PhD, which I'll focus on. Uh, and then also looking forward to my, uh, how I designed and uh, have been implementing my own doctoral research, how feminist standpoint theory has really helped me to think through some of these issues about how to be, how to do truly feminist research and how uh, a methodology can, can reflect feminist values and, and underpinnings. Uh, so just in case feminist standpoint theory are uh, new words put together uh, that um, you may not have taken a course in, um, as we are forced to, um, <laughs> as part of our theories course. Um, so just a couple of main points about what is feminist standpoint theory in brief. So it's again, the, as with other feminist epistemologies and, and theories, uh, it's the recognition that knowledge is socially situated. And so it doesn't come from some other worldly place. It's, it's very much socially constructed. And therefore we need to have a socially informed uh, approach to understanding uh, what do we know, who knows what, and really questioning where knowledge comes from. Um, also a contribution that feminist standpoint theory has made is this focus on marginalized groups. And I think in the earlier writings of feminist standpoint theory, it was very much on women, which was reflective of the times of women in development and women and development. And again, I'm getting too much into this theory course that I talked about before, so I'll move on. Um, essentially, it's, it's, it's pointing us to the fact that we need to look where voices may have either been silenced or underprivileged or, or otherwise muzzled or absent. Um, and the conclusion, of course, and sort of the, the main lesson is that research should really start with marginalized voices and, and work our way there. And that helps us to understand these underlying uh, power structures uh, and can understand experiences. And so for the work that I've uh, been involved with, both before my, my PhD and, and now, has really been in context of post-conflict. Uh, and well, actually in, in the first project I'll talk about, it's actually uh, in some cases, the conflicts and emergency, emergencies have been protracted and are ongoing. And so that adds sort of an extra layer of power and, and all sorts of things happening. So before, in 2015, I was given what I didn't know at the time, but it was the job of a lifetime. I was hired by the Swedish Red Cross to come work with uh, a very uh, dynamic group of individuals within the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement. Uh, as part of this volunteering and conflicts and emergencies initiative, which unfortunately has the acronym VICE, which has connotations of other things, if anyone's ever seen a police procedural. Um, but that is not what we research. We are researching very much local volunteers working within the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement. So if you've ever seen news, news coverage of a disaster or, or a war, you'll often see these faceless red vests floating around, um, maybe a spokesperson from, from the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement speaking. And what we realized uh, in the Red Cross, Red Cross, Red Crescent movement is that while we understand that volunteers are, quote, the backbone of the movement and of humanitarian assistance, we know very little about who these volunteers were. And of course, uh, we didn't know at the time that we were maybe doing feminist uh, research or, or feminist inspired methodology um, research, but uh, we decided to start with volunteers. Again, these silenced voices or, or underprivileged uh, voices uh, and experiences that otherwise had not been probed. So I have the book here. It's called A Time to Listen by Anderson, uh, Brown and Jean from 2012. And this was very much methodologically speaking, the inspiration for the Vice Listening Study. Um, this book, uh, and it is part of the CDA project that was alluded to before by Yana. Um, it, it was, I think, at the time, a very groundbreaking study talking to, uh, I can't remember, I think 2,000 people on the receiving end of aid. And for the first time, it was a very comprehensive study focusing on people's experiences of what it meant to receive, to be on the recipient of, of development programming or humanitarian assistance uh, uh, aid. Um, and this to us was sort of turning the, the tables on how we normally do things. Of course, 
qualitative research has already been always been part of monitoring and evaluation processes, focus group discussions, of course. Um, but this methodology was particular in the sense that it did not come with a set of questions. It sort of came with an overarching kickoff to a listening session. And then it allowed a participant or a narrator to take the time allotted for the interview or the listening session to just talk about what they wanted to talk about in relation to uh, aid. And so we were very much inspired by this. You know, we threw out our, our questionnaires, we threw out this idea of preconceived notions of what we want to know, um, and, and we started from there. So this was very much a co-production. I mentioned I was working with the Swedish Red Cross at the time. It was led uh, by uh, a mad genius, Stefan Agaram, who is in this picture on the right, second from the right at the back. Um, and he conceived this as something that the movement needed and perhaps even the humanitarian industry needs. Um, and partnered with, uh, the, with Northumbria University in the UK, Matt Bailey-Smith, Anisha Thomas, who came on board. But really the driving force were our partners in the six contexts, the six countries where we went and did listening sessions. So that was in Afghanistan, Honduras, Myanmar, South Sudan, Sudan, and Ukraine. And I had the immense privilege of uh, conducting listening sessions with local volunteers in four out of those six countries. Um, so I won't go into the sort of the statistics, but a wide range of experiences. And essentially what it looked like was myself and a partner, or if I, it wasn't me, someone else and a partner within the team from outside, so not a national of that, that country for power dynamic issues, um, would come in. So often it was myself and a colleague from, uh, from Burundi, Balthazar. Let's say we would go to Ukraine and then we would conduct these listening sessions and we would sit down the two of us with either a group uh, or an individual or a pair and we would say what is it like to be a volunteer here and that was it and we would shut up for about 60 to 90 minutes turn the recorder on and just let people take the time that they wanted to to talk about whatever they want they thought was pertinent and what they wanted to say and it was astounding um, what people revealed and I think what for us became very clear very quickly was that we don't know what we didn't know if we came in asking about equipment and safety and gender relations and you know threw down words like that we would have steered the, the, the conversation and it would no longer be what I now understand it, it would be unfeminist it, I, in, in my view so really providing space for people to speak about their lived experiences was something very groundbreaking for me to experience, to understand. And then, um, and then also, uh, I think made immense contributions to uh, understanding what does it mean to be a local volunteer in these places that are, you know, under siege or highly insecure. So I, it, as you can imagine, it generated mountains of data. <laughs> um, and it's very difficult to pull out one quote that sort of illustrates everything I'd like to say. So I didn't do that. I did pull out a quote that I thought might be somewhat relevant to today's topic and, and perhaps who might be uh, in the room and interested. Um, so this is a quote from a female volunteer. I can't tell you which country she is from, but um, uh, in any case, we, I'm using her as a representative. And so something that we didn't ask specifically, and we never said, what are the gender issues here? But something that came up over the course of our conversation was, she says, and I quote, I'd say a woman's role, not only in society, but in volunteering as well on the working side is quite marginalized. And I compare it and that helped me back what then to reflect on the role that we female volunteers have. Because sometimes, many times we're told, go ahead, give them your best smile and you'll manage to get that for us. Because we've been told that occasionally. And then I say, no, I'm more than that, going and laughing with someone in order to try and get something for my colleagues. As a woman, I need to see what I can be for my society. And I don't think we ever would have heard that if I had come and said, what is it like to be a woman? What are your gender issues? Tell us about things that your colleagues have said that have annoyed you. I never would have known to ask those questions. And so that really inspired me uh, when a, a year or so later when I came to do my PhD, how am I doing for time, Kate? Two minutes, great. Um, uh, to think more theoretically around what it is that we were doing uh, in the listening project and how can I take that methodology and that approach and, uh, and answer a question that had been bothering me for quite a long time as a gender advisor and a gender uh, based violence uh, program manager and, and so forth for, for many years as a practitioner before coming back to school. Um, I also want to draw your attention to my amazing RA on the right, Davichelvi Rasson, who's based in Jaffna, 
Um, and I must say that none of this research uh, up until none of the research that I did in the fields would be remotely possible without her. Um, and so I spoke to her this morning and I gave her a photo and she didn't like it. So she sent me this one. <laughs> so it is, it's approved. She's, she's happy to be up there. Um, so essentially, as, as the intro mentioned, my big question is uh, for my PhD is, you know, if you were, I, I, I'd like to know what is the long-term impact of development aid programming in post-conflict situations? If we go back 10 years after, you know, a gender mainstream water and sanitation program has been implemented, what do we find? And I wasn't really interested in hearing it from NGOs because of course, you know, I can read reports and, and I've, I've been working for NGOs. I, I know what I would say. I want to hear it from the people 10 years later or five, six years later. And so we went in and we did something similar. We did uh, life histories or oral histories, which has a long tradition in anthropology. And we talked about, and we just asked the one question, you know, and this is, these were all individual only. And we said, uh, you know, if you were to write a book about your life, what are the stories that you would fill it with? Some probing sometimes needed to be necessary, but uh, for the most part, it worked. Um, I think I'll skip to the reflections. So first of all, just listening is harder than it sounds, pun intended. Um, it is very difficult to sit back and let someone else talk for 60 minutes, 90 minutes, two hours, get interrupted by tea, get interrupted by things. Um, it, it's hard to, to relinquish that control. And I think that's, that's something that we must work at um, when we do this particular kind of research. Um, different interpretation, interpretations of feminism and deeming who is marginalized can challenge and expand our discourse. So I mentioned at the beginning um, of standpoint feminist theory, the focus was really on women, and then of course it expanded outwards. In my sample, I spoke to six women and four men. Um, I'm also interested in learning about the different marginalizations that take place, how different people have experienced aid, not just what I think who might be marginalized. Um, and this, is, this also comes out of deep conversations with my RA and, and it's still continuing. Um, this type of methodology also requires intense investment of resources. The VICE project was a once in a lifetime opportunity. We were given a vast sum of money and a lot of space and time administratively from the Red Cross, from the Swedish Red Cross in particular, to do whatever it is that we needed to do. And it took a lot of time and it took a lot of money, um, travel, translation, all sorts of things. Um, it doesn't have to, but at that scale, it did. Uh, my own research, of course, spending time with 10 people doesn't sound like a lot, but when you were trying to build rapport and this theme of trust, you know, you really need to take the time to keep going back and, and meeting people and having those cups of tea and, and so forth. Um, there's also, uh, of course, reciprocity. We mentioned inherent power dynamics between the researcher and the researched. I thought a lot about how to um, reciprocate in some way. I sort of offered to take photos and have them printed as maybe sort of a token gesture and nobody was interested in that. <laughs> they all just wanted to, to tell their story, which, which was very uh, humbling and also uh, applies an immense amount of pressure on me now when I'm writing up. Also, just two last reflections. I realize uh, truth is subjective. There is no one truth. If someone tells me they received something in 2008 or nine or 10, I'm not gonna go back and check if they did. If they told me that, you know, I, I, I'm not interested in, in, in uh, an objective fact. I'm interested in, in perception um, and understanding and sense making. Memory is also imperfect um, and lived experiences are often visceral. So these conversations can get very emotional and intense. And I think that um, preparation needs to be something uh, that's, that's, that's taken seriously for, for any researcher, student or otherwise. And then the last thing I'll say before I'm yanked off the stage <laughs> is um, uh, diverse experiences and understandings, which is what I'm, I, my, my research is after, they make invaluable contributions to, to knowledge production, but they also really complicate things. Nothing fits in a box. Life is messy, and so too are these feminist research methodologies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Jessica. Um, up, up next, uh, our fourth pa panelist is Pascal Saint-Denis. Uh, Pascal is a fourth year uh, co-op undergrad student at the School of International Development and Global Studies at the University of Ottawa. Her research areas of work include volunteering for development and gender equality and women's empowerment, specifically in Latin America, 
She recently returned from Peru after having spent two months collecting data to evaluate CUSO International's Volunteering for International Cooperation and Empowerment, or VOICE, program. And this data will also contribute to Dr. Thiessen's SHRC-funded research examining how international volunteer programs impact and contribute to gender equality in host communities. So welcome, Pascal. <laughs> Thank you, Kate, for the introduction. Thank you to everyone on the panel for your contributions and your presentations. Um, so in my presentation, I will be discussing um, my experience evaluating the volunteer impacts and contributions to gender equality and women empowerment in host communities in Peru. So um, my experience in Peru served two purposes, actually, and the, um, one of which was uh, the study that Rebecca mentioned on the impacts of international volunteers and promotion of gender equality and women's economic empowerment. And the other was the evaluation of the VOICE project in Peru, which focused on assessing how CUSO's in, uh, partner organizations and the international volunteers have impacted the lives of individual beneficiaries and in communities. Specifically, we wanted to know what were the impacts that they had on gender equality and on women empowerment. Um, so this presentation will only actually touch on the evaluation. Hopefully Rika in her pre presentation will be able to fill the gap on uh, the study with her work in Senegal. So the sample of participations in the evaluation was defined based on certain criteria, whether they had um, received services from volunteers and if they, had, um, if they were direct beneficiaries of the partner organizations. So these included individuals from more marginalized groups, such as indigenous women, youth with disabilities, rural and urban farmers, also uh, local feminist volunteers and members of municipal and uh, state institutions. We attempted uh, to be as inclusive as we could in our methodology, but due to some challenges on which I will touch on in a few minutes, we were a bit limited in doing so. So I ended up conducting 15 semi-structured interviews and two focus groups. Um, what we wanted to understand was how gender equality and women empowerment in beneficiaries' lives and communities have been impacting since collaborating with CUSO International's partner organizations and their volunteers. Interviews consisted of open-ended questions, um, which allowed for storytelling and more qualitative data, while other questions attempted to sort of quantify the impacts in different categories, such as economic, uh, social, health, environmental, and capacity building. Also, um, other approaches we use, being a white volunteer slash researcher from the Global South, uh, we attempted to reduce power dynamics as much as we could in our interviews with beneficiaries. Um, so we introduced a presence um, from the um, Global South, so a South-South volunteer to accompany me in all of my interviews that took place in Lima. We also encouraged participants to do volunteers in groups of two uh, to create a safer space for them to share, their, to share their lived experiences. And this is also one of the reasons why we decided, or CUSO decided that I would facilitate uh, focus groups. We also used any other resources, limited resources that we had available to us, um, which made it possible to have a more inclusive sample, such as the use of Quechua translators and sign language interpreters. Uh, there are, however, certain factors that influence how we developed our methodology. Um, issue of communication between the Ottawa office and the field was a uh, very important one. And although CUSO is in constant contact with the country program office and receive um, annual um, program reports and other country level data, of course, there are certain aspects of the field uh, that don't actually reach the head office, especially at the beneficiary level. So uh, Yana and I had attempted to sort of develop these methodologies from the CUSO office. Uh, and in the end, these weren't actually really that applicable um, just because of how certain partner organizations function um, and how they provide their services to the beneficiaries. So uh, we had tried to predetermine um, the criteria for the selection of the beneficiaries that would participate in the evaluation based on the reach of each one. Uh, not realizing that this wasn't actually feasible. And then um, due to the fact that certain volunteers hadn't actually come into contact with many of the beneficiaries for some working in communications, for example. And some partner organizations such as state institutions didn't actually have direct beneficiaries that they were providing services for. Another issue was the time constraint. So methods <laughs> were only properly established, I would say about my third or fourth week in my 10 week placement. Uh, in Peru. 
Although with the help of the country program office, uh, due to the time constraint, we had to proceed in a bit of um, disorderly manner at first and then sort of figure out the methodology as we went. Um, and unfortunately, uh, this led to insufficient time spent in rural regions um, because we did not have the time to, co to better coordinate with partner organizations that act sort of uh, as the gatekeeper, second level of gatekeepers to the least accessible individuals um, that live in these rural areas. So this disproportionately impacted um, the, the sample with a concentration of beneficiaries that were in Lima that don't actually comprise of the m more marginalized group that were actually the intended target of um, the evaluation. Um, so, and also we did not, we were not able to reach uh, the target number of interviews due to this issue. There are however some uh, key aspects that we can take from this experience. Um, so the structure of the interviews and the focus group, uh, it was very efficient in giving beneficiaries the space for, to answer questions through storytelling, which provided a certain depth to the assessment of the impact of the voice project. Uh, participants were able to bring out certain themes that weren't actually included in the interview questions at first, which is especially common in the focus groups and in the, um, the interviews where there were more than one participant. Uh, what was especially important that we learned uh, was how participants could discuss their relationships with the volunteers, providing great stories, great examples, and anecdotes. This allowed us to be, um, allowed us in our report writing to, uh, of our evaluation to understand how the volunteering core development model can be efficient in promoting gender equality and women empowerment. The evaluation also provided us with a learning opportunity to try to use more participatory methods uh, for potentially richer data in the future. Um, this type of approach would have been beneficial to the inclusiveness of the methodology, but as Yana mentioned, there are certain um, constraints and uh, resource issues. Um, but having been developed sort of with uh, limited or uh, little input of CUSO's in-country program office, um, who are, as I mentioned, the gatekeepers to the beneficiaries, this sort of challenged us in our efficiency to actually um, proceed with the evaluation, or at least um, in, in country. So the entire uh, experience was a constant learning experience, taking on the role as a research, of a research assistant and a CUSO volunteer. Um, what I believe was the most was most important was uh, how the challenges of working in a bit of a disorientating context and also under a time constraint pushed my ability to always be adapting. And in order to adapt, you have to know how to ask the right questions and who to ask those questions to. And this is where the country program office played a really essential role in providing me um, with adequate information to uh, sort of go forward in the, in the evaluation. Um, when, so when certain aspects of our methodology went out the window, um, they were able to sort of help guide me and sort of reorientate me um, to sort of understand how we were going to proceed with the, with the evaluation. I also had to learn how to build relationships in a very short amount of time. I invested a lot of sort of my off time as a volunteer um, to attend so I have as many events as I could with uh, volunteers and beneficiaries alike and partner organizations. Um, for example, I went, I participated in the Lima Pride Parade, which I thought was super cool mm -hmm. with uh, one of uh, CUSO's partner organization, a leading feminist organization in Peru. Um, I also ad attended a certification launch uh, event, which is very interesting and also very helpful in sort of deciding the, the questions I would include in the evaluation, in the interviews. And um, so this is all in the goal of building relationships and a trust, which in the end I noticed actually had an impact on how, when you compare the interviews I did with beneficiaries that I had already spent time with and that I already got to know compared to those I hadn't actually had the chance to spend time with, there, is a, there was a difference in sort of their level of comfort with me and to, to share their experiences, to share their, um, their lives because they, they didn't feel that sort of level of comfort with me. <laughs> so I think this experience was a great opportunity for us to learn how we can be more inclusive in our methodologies. And it also demonstrates how we should 
include local knowledge of our partners in the Global South in every step of the process to better reach our research goals. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Pascal. Uh, our last panelist is Rika Mpogesi. Uh, Rika is an undergraduate student at the University of Ottawa, completing a bilingual honors bachelor degree in international development and globalization with a minor in political science. She currently serves as the vice president of activism and equity for the International Development Students Association, as well as the vice president of logistics at the Pre-Law Society of the University of Ottawa. In May 2019, she received the first place prize of the Social Innovation Showcase, which is organized by the U Ottawa Ventures Program for a project that sought to use participatory art programs to help shape social attitudes and eliminate stigma surrounding widowhood in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Through her volunteering and her studies, she's traveled to various countries such as Colombia, the DRC, Rwanda, Brazil, and most recently, Senegal. Welcome, Rika. Thank you for the introduction and thank you to my fellow panelists. Hello, my name is Rika. Um, so today I'll be discussing my experience in Senegal. Um, I was sent in June 2019 by Professor Rebecca Thiessen to gather data on international volunteers and their contributions to gender equality and women's empowerment. Um, and so before beginning the process of conducting this research, I had to go through a screening process. So that meant that I had to submit the questionnaire that I was going to use and get it approved to make sure that the questions were clear and appropriate in the context that I was going to be using it in. Uh, once that was through, I went along and started contacting partners, partner organizations of the SOSI, um, the SOSI Senegal. Um, when picking the organizations themselves, I wanted to kind of diversify uh, the spectrum. On one hand, I had organizations that worked specifically uh, in women's development. Uh, so that means uh, their social development, their political participation, their health, etc. cetera. Um, but on the other hand, I wanted to also uh, work with organizations that didn't necessarily explicitly work with women. So I'm talking about uh, job training, professional training, et cetera. What I found uh, in the beginning of my research uh, was that the representatives that I was speaking to from the women's groups were, tended to be uh, women. So you had coordinators, directors, presidents who were women. On the other hand, when I spoke to organizations uh, that worked in job training, et cetera, agriculture as well, it tended to be men. And so when I had interviews, I had different perspectives. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in that sense also, um, sorry, I'm trying to look at my notes here. Mm -hmm. um, so I had different responses. Uh, most of the partners would say that the volunteers did con contribute uh, positively to their work. Uh, others mentioned the duration of the mandates of volunteers was quite short. I myself was sent for two months and I can attest to that. Um, I would say that you get to work um, you feel like you're contributing a lot more if you stay longer. Obviously, I had the time constraint. I had to go back to school and finish my education, my degree. <laughs> um, and you listed all the jobs that I have now at university as well. Um, so yeah, so obviously I had a time constraint. Uh, but as a volunteer, uh, they also noted uh, the, part the organizations they noted that there was a difference between an intern, for example, like myself, and a volunteer. A volunteer really is there to immerse themselves in the community, to work, to work alongside the people uh, living and working there, uh, whereas an intern is kind of, uh, I would say, as a visiting scholar would be. So you're gathering data and then you leave right away. You don't necessarily have to create those links uh, because you have a certain uh, format that you follow and then and that's the job you have to do. Um, I, f I uh, personally found that I would gather more data if I actually immersed myself in, within the communities. Um, so I did try to practice participant uh, observation. Um, as you mentioned, it does help you kind of gather more data. Um, and when I was asking the questions, although the questionnaire was well uh, structured and the questions were very specific, I tried the method of asking every question in the beginning of the process. Towards the end, I realized that as Jessica mentioned, if you just ask one general question and you sit there for 60 minutes, you get all the <laughs> answers you need. So that's what I did. Um, and so I would ask the general question and for 50 to 
50 minutes to an hour, uh, the person I was speaking to would just elaborate. Mm -hmm. And I think that they felt more comfortable towards the end if I just added one word, two words, oh, how do you think this should go, et cetera, et cetera, uh, because it made them feel like they were really um, in charge of the conversation. And so they felt more open and more comfortable. Another thing is uh, my positionality. So I would say I am a Canadian, um, but I think that my background being that my mother and father are from Rwanda and from Congo, um, since I do have experience with African cultures, I think that it also facilitated my integration into certain areas, into certain spaces. Uh, when I was speaking to partner organizations, the directors, the presidents, um, they would start the conversation formally, as most, most of you have noticed as well, but towards the end, they get more comfortable. Mm -hmm. I also noted um, that when I was asking questions about volunteer contributions, uh, they would say, for example, they would mention, as we, we talked about post-colonial perspectives or bringing Western values to certain contexts, um, they would really feel more comfortable, I think, because I was of an African background and because I was uh, I really represent kind of intersectionalities. They didn't feel like they had uh, to retain themselves mm -hmm. and they felt a little bit more open. So it definitely helped with gathering data on that perspective. Um, when I was asking about gender equality, um, I would, as Rebecca, as, the, as Professor Thiessen mentioned, um, say the word feminist and kind of see what the reaction would be, what they would talk about. And so I would just sit down and I would say, um, so what is your perspective on a word like, like feminism? And every single one of the, the interviewees would sit down and really think about the question because I think that it's not necessarily discussed very often. Um, so they had to sit and ponder. And from the perspective of, from the context of Senegal, I think feminism at the time in the 70s and 80s was reserved to a certain group of, of women, to intellectuals, to people who were of the elite. But now they recognize that uh, with programs like the Unitaire program, with the Ceci Cusso, that it is opening up a discussion and that more people can be integrated in the conversation, both m women and men uh, from all different social classes and backgrounds. So that's what I got a sense of um, and seeing that I myself is a, I'm a research assistant and I am a part of different um, I guess you could say social categories they recognize that even I am a part of this realm um, of, of feminist research and and, and development efforts etc um, so that really helped I will say also just because um, I went from the very structured interview questions to the less structured interview questions I also tried to practice informal interviewing just um, as Pascal mentioned, you have to really be integrated. So you have to make friends, you have mm -hmm. to talk to people. And within those organizations, I try to scope out where are the women, as you all mentioned as well, mm -hmm. um, asking them the questions that I was also asking to the directors. So if the director is a man and he has certain experiences, then I'll talk to maybe the secretary and see what she thinks. And then I would get different answers because, ob oops, sorry. <laughs> because obviously they're different perspectives. Um, and so informal interviewing definitely gave people gave me a better sense of, of the living conditions of women in Senegal. Um, and I do also think that uh, since my research was focused in the region of Dakar, uh, the capital of Senegal, I did kind of have a specific um, the representation of the living conditions of women. Uh, some have mentioned also that if I went in the south, it would have been a completely different reality. And so I think that scope is broadening uh, the, the scope of where we want to be asking these questions also helps us understand that there is a diversity of experiences, even within a country. In Dakar, uh, people spoke, speak French, speak Wolof, but if you go in other regions, they speak Peul. And so since the official language would be is um, is French and I guess Wolof. Um, certain certain women feel marginalized because not only are they women, mm -hmm. uh, but they are of a social a certain social class, and they don't have uh, the education that is necessarily to uh, de develop themselves professionally. But also, they don't speak the language. So there are different groups and categories of women within the same country where I was researching that I did not get to to uh, reach out to. Um, but I do think that the, the data that I did collect, I try to be as diverse and as um, general as I can be. Um, one last thing that I noticed, how much time do I have? 
Mm-hmm. One last thing that I noticed is uh, when asking about gender equality programs that they establish, I think that the perception in Senegal, at least I can say, is that there is a goal that they, they need to achieve. And then once they've reached the goal, then that's it. Mm-hmm. And there, there's no need to further the efforts of gender equality. Um, but as I, I mentioned, I took Uh, interviews from the women's group and other organizations to see kind of have a transversal approach on how women are being integrated into certain spaces. Um, And what I found is for the men that I was asking these questions to, how do volunteers contribute to gender equalities? They would say, well, we have workshops and there's a 50-50, always a 50-50 parity, men and women. Or sometimes there's 40 men and 60% women. Um, And that's it. And that's how we reach our goal and gender equality, and that's it. <laughs> but I realized that when you go to the to really speak to women, um, they're, this is not really answering their needs. And their needs is uh, this kind of quota touches on equality, but not necessarily equity. And equality in the sense that there are 50-50 present in the room but if a woman has to go to the market at 10 a.m and misses two hours of the beginning or she has to go home at 3 p.m and go cook a meal for her for her family where are we accommodating her to make sure that she is also receiving the same kind of services from the volunteers themselves and from the organizations so definitely um some have pointed out that volunteers even mentioned uh of in establishing infrastructure such as daycares, um, such as uh, talking to officials about changing uh, certain policies and laws allowing for maternity leaves to be um, to be longer in Senegal, it's three months. So some volunteers and some partner organizations are working together on legislations, on efforts to uh, ameliorate uh, structures and to facilitate uh, the balance between the double workload, reproductive and productive work for the women in Senegal. Mm -hmm. Um, But overall, great experience. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much to all the members of our fantastic panel. We've heard a lot about uh, the considerations, practical, ethical, methodological. We've also heard about different methods, MEL, ethnography, listening sessions, interviews, and focus groups. So I, I think anyone who's, who's tuning in online or who's in here today has potentially worked with one of those methods and can think about their own experience in relation to what was being said and probably relate and and roll their eyes in the same places and and commiserate with some of the challenges, but also identify the the potential for a really rich um, data collection that that come along with these feminist methodologies. I'd like to turn now immediately for the last 10-15 minutes or so to questions. Uh, I will uh, check for the online group momentarily, but I'd like to start again by seeing if there are any questions from those participating uh, in the audience here in Ottawa. Yes, uh, please use your microphone and introduce yourself. Hi, um, I'm Kai. I'm a researcher at IDRC uh, with Network Economies. Um, something that I picked up um, from Rebecca's and and also um, all of the presenters' uh, presentation was the need to decentralize critical analysis, right? Because I think there's a need to own it, there's a need to process it, there's a need to understand it, and then the whole sense making. And definitely, you know, having an RA and interpreter and translator, those things help. What does decentralizing critical analysis look like? And then, and then, can that is that part of your methodology at some point because that's after the fact of you collecting data right and then now who's unpacking it who's actually validating it and 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 um this is also a phase where i'm currently right now so i'm also thinking about these issues too so your thoughts would be really helpful I'd like to add a question to that, actually. Um, so I, I gave a bit of an overview of some of the ways that I have done that by uh, having the resources to hire research assistants to analyze the data and then to write up the findings and to own that. But that's a particular privileged 
place that I'm in right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. so my follow-up question is, what are some of the aspirations that some of you maybe have as masters and PhD students towards feminist methodology uh, and the constraints that you might experience in trying to, to be as feminist as you might like to be and to, to try, you know, because you might value this idea of decentralizing the analysis, um, but, but have limitations because of, because of your position, your funding, the way that you have to present information. So yeah, may, maybe others want to, would anyone else on the panel like to add their response to that? Um, again, speaking from a, a place of, of privilege, um, the Vice Listening Project uh, had the funding to bring the co-production team from those six countries that I mentioned, plus Sweden, Canada, Burundi, et cetera. And we didn't just use them, or, or, I mean, we didn't just rely on our, our colleagues to organize you know the focus groups or, or the listening sessions in country but we actually had several meetings throughout the the year where we would we actually grappled with the coding which for practitioners you know working with data can sound really scary and it seems like an opaque process and very scientific but actually you know when you when you get down to it it's really just you know finding themes and discussing and so we spent a lot of time we had a workshop in dubai at one point um, where we, we brought our partners from from these various countries um, to to really develop the coding structure so it wasn't a top-down uh, centralized it was much more of a decentralized process um, I wonder how that would have worked if we if we could have done it remotely uh, if we didn't have the funds to bring everyone into one place in one part of the world I wonder if there are some other technolo technologies that could maybe help with that um, at the moment my research assistant who's based in Jaffna northern Sri Lanka uh, and I are working through the transcripts from my from from our listening sessions or our life history sessions, um, and we do a lot of it over WhatsApp. Uh, we do a lot of it over Skype. So I wonder if maybe there's something to be said about sort of working remotely through that, and maybe some some technological help. Any other questions from the room? Yes, please uh, introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Alex um, Abdelhab. I actually used to be a CUSO International Volunteer and I was involved in voice uh, in Guyana from 2016 to 2017. Um, so I, I guess listening to Yana's pr um, presentation, I was kind of thinking we, we do do a lot of like input output uh, results. Like we're like, we did this, we had 50 people at our sessions, whatever. Ta -da. But I guess um, I'm kind of more interested in how do you translate that m more into that outcome idea? Because I know that that's like whenever you're reporting back to GAC, you're like, you know, you're aiming for a 10% increase of like, how do you kind of like balance those two, um, I guess, opposing ideas? And then I guess even taking it a step forward, further, because we talked about the different ways that you're presenting the information. Um, Professor Tyson, you mentioned that, that like you, Got, you did interviews and maybe people don't necessarily want it to be published in an academic journal or something. How do you kind of also talk about those results in a way that's actually meaningful and will make a difference? So thank you for the question. It's a very good point. And I think particularly the forms that volunteers get to fill out are very output driven. I totally agree. We do have other tools where we're looking more at the outcome level. A lot of it is obviously from stems from what we committed to when we designed the project many years ago when basically no one from the current staff was around. So it's kind of the inheritance line too. But so we're looking, for example, at increases of skills and competencies within the partner organization. So they're obviously the product of your volunteer placement, but are like more on a scale. So there is a little bit more of a systematization in the way how we collect the data through the annual partnership reviews that maybe you have assisted with. Uh -huh. And uh, it's, it's imperfect though, it doesn't go all the way. So really, I'd our kind of ultimate level, we are supposed to be improving the well-being of the beneficiaries of the communities, of the members of organizations, etc. And that is exactly why we're doing this small-scale final evaluation, because we want to learn what's actually happening in the field. What is left after you leave, after you finish your placement? We have very little insights into that, so that's kind of what we're at now, trying to improve, trying to get a little bit more data from the field, from the very kind of last degree of distance, as I was saying in my presentation, and we've had a great help. Thank you. 
I uh, just wanted to add there are no questions coming in online, so it's not that I'm ignoring them. Uh, they're just not there. Uh, hi, yeah, please uh, answer or raise hi, your question and introduce yourself. My name is Christine Block, and I've mainly worked on the humanitarian uh, or refugee side uh, and as a practitioner working on uh, mainstreaming age, gender and diversity and on accountability to affected populations. One thing I wanted to ask is that we've talked a lot about the monitoring and the evaluation, but we haven't actually talked about the participatory process in developing the program in the first place. And I think this is actually where I, I feel that there's the biggest need for a participatory process uh, in order to get the program right in the first place. Um, so that, that, that's one question. And I had a little comment um, I agree with Jessica that the open-ended discussions often get you the most information. And one of the methodologies for analysis that I've used in practice has actually been trying to, at the end, summarize what, what are the concerns or what are the issues that I've heard, and then asking people to validate it, and then to perhaps even prioritize it. Um, so that's been some of the methodologies I've been using. I just want to add to, to your question, because uh, it may be our last one. In, in speaking about setting up the research process, uh, if you're doing partnerships with maybe women's NGOs or local, locally based groups, a part of setting up the partnership is having an MOU or in a partnership agreement. And I wonder if there are challenges associated with that type of a document for facilitating feminist engagement, or if maybe that's a space where there are opportunities for doing that. So anyone of you who have worked on a partnership agreement or an MOU, if you could speak to that as part of your uh, response to the question about establishing uh, these research projects from the get-go as feminist and participatory specifically. Uh, just coming back to first, I just I'm going to answer three points here. One, Alex, your your question about um, the findings that might be perhaps critical, and and you know it's I've been doing research for a number of years, and I, I often don't think about um, all of the power dimensions that I might encounter, and so I'm working closely with partner organizations in Canada, and and I'm quite familiar with some of the limitations and and, and concerns they might have about critical work that might be done and, and as learning organizations I've found that they're very receptive to you know a thoughtful critique that's maybe attached to some suggestions or recommendations and so there's always that space what I didn't anticipate and I've been to a few countries now doing this data collection in the last several months was the level of concern by the partner organization in country and the very clear power dimension that exists that I hadn't anticipated um, of course, they're also learning organizations, but they're in a position of potential vulnerability because their funding could be cut. Um, they may no longer be the partner organization that delivers programming on the ground. And uh, they were very concerned with the nature of my research because it wasn't necessarily going to reflect how they have always been demonstrating progress and success and so on. And so um, I realized at that point the importance of being more clear about the role that I played and what impact I anticipated having and that I wasn't a consultant and I wasn't doing evaluations of their programs, but I was trying to be constructive and carry out research that would be useful for, for um, improving program outputs. So, but again, it was, a, it was an important reminder of the very important power dimensions that exist uh, and that we have to be mindful of and that communication can help resolve but not necessarily. And I agree entirely, Christine, with the importance of the particip participatory process. In fact, you know, when I teach international development, I teach my students the first thing that needs to happen in any community work is a needs assessment and identification of what the community wants um, to, to have done in their communities. And I don't do that. I, I start with the predefined idea of what I want to do because if they decide that they want climate change adaptation in their community, mm, it's not my area, right? So that's a real gap and it is a challenge and it means that um, 
that participatory process where people actually co-design the research, there has to be that there has to be some kind of negotiation and uh, mutual interest um, in a research capacity approach. Uh, but more needs to be done to create the funding that it will allow that engagement in the first place and to find the right match with the communities that do see that as a needs priority and want to focus on that and invest their time and energy in, in the process. And then in terms of setting up partnerships, um, of course, there's a, an MOU that happens in the research collaborations that I have with my partner organizations. Um, and uh, um, I think yeah, I think that they're, they're, that, that can be shared. It's, it's a way to make sure that the conversations that we've had are, are in, on paper and that I don't go rogue, I suppose, and, <laughs> <laughs> and, and start to, you know, and say things that are unfair or un, un, um, unrepresentative of, of the, the nature of the research that we have agreed to. All right, thank you so much. Um, for those of you who are in person, you can, you're welcome to stick around, but for those uh, online, I'll, I'll make sure we end in a timely fashion. It's now three o'clock. Uh, I just want to first flag that our next Wed Lab seminar will be on the topic of social norms and women's empowerment, taking place in a couple of weeks from now on the 24th of September. Um, you can visit the WedLab website for more information. We also have three additional seminars coming up this year, one on quantitative research methodologies, which Rebecca pointed to earlier. Um, that'll be in October and November. We have a seminar on uh, women's entrepreneurship in the green and low carbon economy. And in December, we'll have a seminar on women in conflict. So I just want to flag those for you. Starting next Monday, the 16th, you'll be able to find a recording of this webinar, the PowerPoint slides, suggested readings, etc., online. So you can find that on our website. You can share it with anyone you think might be interested uh, in listening to what we talked about today. And lastly, I just want to thank, uh, first of all, our panelists. Thank you, Rebecca, Yana, Sheila, Jessica, Pascal, and Rika, so much for your contributions. It's been a really, I think, rich discussion and uh, left us with a lot to digest and think about in relation to our own work. I want to thank our partners here at IDRC. Um, the Wed Lab seminar series is actually the growth of a partnership between uh, ISID at McGill University and the IDRC, stemming out of the Growth and Economic Opportunities for Women program. It's an IDRC-led program. There are some materials, actually some really fantastic synthesis reports on the outputs of that program uh, available here. If anyone wants to pick them up, free reading material, very shiny, glossy, beautiful as well. So those are here for you to take. And lastly, I want to thank uh, our funders at the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada for their financial support. So that's it from us. Thanks everyone for participating.